Hello. Well, that caused the room to get silent pretty quickly. <laughs> so hopefully you're all in the right place. We're here, we're doing a panel on DevOps in the trenches. So much more sort of lessons actually learned. You would have probably seen a few things from the keynote earlier this morning where we talked about how we don't want, DevOps shouldn't be just a theoretical thing. And it's a pretty fuzzy, sort of loose concept in a lot of ways. But you've seen that, you know, the work that's happened in the DevOps handbook and many of the stories that are being told here at the conference are much more about practical, real world experiences. So with that in mind, we've gathered together a really great panel of people that we're going to start talking about some of these things. We do want to keep this pretty conversational. This is a pretty intimate room. We've got a microphone floating around wherever Michael is over here. Don't feel like you have to save questions for the end. Feel free to just stick your hand up and interrupt with a point. Um, I assume we're going to need a microphone unless you're all really good at projecting, but we should be able to keep the conversation flowing pretty well. So with that, let's start at this end and let's start going through and introducing ourselves. Hi everybody, I'm Erica Morrison. I work for CSG International in Omaha, and I'm a director there over a number of our DevOps teams. Hey everybody, uh, Sanjay Maru from St. Joseph Health, uh, Director of Enterprise Architecture and Strategy, and uh, uh, really kind of spearheading a lot of DevOps stuff. I'm uh, Courtney Kissler, I'm VP of Retail Technology at Starbucks. I'm Mike Hillworth. I'm a technical director at Capgemini, specializing in DevOps in the public sector. Cool. Thank you. And I published images myself, uh, Nigel Kirsten, CIO at Puppet. So one of the things I think we often struggle with when we're trying to like, make DevOps programs work throughout our company is settling on some kind of a definition for communication. So I was wondering if anyone on the panel felt like jumping forward with going, this is what we settled on with our organization that worked pragmatically. So I think for us, uh, let me go first, <laughs> jump in. Uh, for us, uh, it was all about uh, automation. And, and I think for us, uh, process of automation and, and the whole journey that we have to take, that's what we kind of anchored around for DevOps. Uh, I know the traditional uh, uh, kind of uh, agile infrastructure kind of mindset, but uh, automation was something that we anchored on. And I'd say that automation was very central to our definition as well. Uh, something else that we've really focused on is breaking down the silos basically between our development organization and our operations organization. So they're really acting as one team with a partnership instead of kind of opposing forces. For, for me, it was slightly different in that um, prior to joining um, Capgem, I was at a large retailer in the UK where I was putting in DevOps for a year. And one of the first things I had to do actually was do a, a sort of a, a reset on the, their understanding of DevOps. The, the large retail of a uh, traditional enterprise IT environment actually thought that DevOps was just a drop-in replacement for uh, support and operations. However, I view DevOps more of a cultural movement that actually is formed of um, practices and technolo technology. And this cultural change is about communication and about how people work together. So I spent a lot of time evangelizing within the organization about saying that, that actually DevOps, it's not, it's not one team, it's not you know, a job title or one person. Actually, as an organization, we should all be doing DevOps. We should all be thinking in the systems perspective, or all trying to communicate better. And to help us, we have um, uh, the tools that can help us do this, but also we have to change the processes so uh, these are things about you know, continuous integration and trying to, to release quickly. But primarily, it's a cultural, a cultural thing that you, you really sort of, uh, we sort of focused on and, and push, pursued that within the environment. One of the amusing definitions that came up at the Contributor Summit, I think from someone at Sonotype, was DevOps to ops people means we get to do development. Uh -huh. and to developers, it means we don't need ops people. <laughs> So this feels like a pretty good point. You know, I'm sure many of you in the room have either started or been considering programs. Did anyone else have something they wanted to jump in on as far as what they've used as a working definition of DevOps within their organization? I am going to keep asking the crowd to participate, in case you're wondering. So then I go, yep. um, for us, it's, it's really about collaboration. And it's, I try to tell people it's nothing new. It's really about continuous improvement. Right, so it's taking, it's, it's really, oh, sorry. <laughs> you know, knocking down those barriers and trying to get people to work together and improve, right? If, if, you're, if we've got sticking points, let's look at it. Let's look at lead time. What, what's the bottleneck and, and can we move on, right? So it's how do you work well with others? And, and then if you speed up your infrastructure and you speed up your CI pipeline and you run smack into manual testing, then 
that's where the pain point is, right? And how do, how do we get around that? So for us, that's kind of where it's at. So I think a good segue before you give up the mic and before I hand the question on to the panel is, does your definition of DevOps, is that, was that impacted by the actual problems you were facing inside your organization? Like was cycle times and lack of sort of speed, were they the things causing you to start to go there? You know, for us, it was really merging two airlines together was a, a huge endeavor, and, and we doubled the number of systems, and we said, we've got all of these things that are coming together. How are we going to be able to do this without, you know, losing our lunch, basically, right? And, and how are we going to... And so it was really more... I don't know that we called it DevOps back then. It was really, oh, how do we all connect, and how are we going to collaborate, and how are we going to create value and, and kind of speed up our integration to market? Cool. So yeah, I'd ask that back to the panel. Like, did your whether you picked on collaboration or automation or breaking down organizational silos, were they the problems that you were perceiving? You just sort of adjusted your DevOps definition to fit. No, I think the market. I mean, we we did it because we wanted. It was a very, it's a highly competitive market in retail. Uh, very low margins. There's new entrants coming in, and actually, in the traditional way of, of IT, all the things that we could add value to were outsourced. And, all, and, and we were actually, we were running data centers and, and having, you know, large teams running SANS and looking after networks and stuff. No matter how well you do those, you're never going to be able to sell more, more stuff. So we were going through a, a sort of digital transformation. And as part of that, DevOps was, was, was giving us some sort of silver bullet. And fundamentally, what we wanted to do was to bring in house all the stuff that when you do it well and you, and you can add value, it helps you, the company actually succeed. And all the stuff that no matter how well you do it, you're never going to you know, get any more cash to, to actually outsource that. So that, that was the competitive, really cutthroat market and, and, and the, the desire to, to compete and to add, add value. That's why we did this digital transformation and that's why DevOps was part of it. And that was similar for me. It was uh, how do you be relevant in digital when you've been traditionally a brick and mortar retailer? And ours was up until that point, it was all about cost. Every optimization that was done in the organization was about cost. And it's like, no, we got to optimize for speed. And that is a huge shift. Mm. And then it was what should we do in order to optimize for speed? And what's our value stream? And then how do we continuously improve against that? Of which those mindsets and practices are applied. I will tell you, there were also the, let's just lab label it DevOps, and it's magic, which is not true. Um, so it's like, how do you unwind some of that as well so that it is more about um, picking the right countermeasure to actually improve? For us, uh, the problem was a little bit different being in healthcare. Uh, I think it's uh, demand, demand, demand. And, and rising demand and trying to manage all of the demand that we were continuously getting with the same amount of uh, uh, resources uh, was something that we looked at and we came up with the strategy. It was part of automation was part of that. And that's what we kind of anchored around and that's how he said, okay, uh, that's the catalyst. DevOps is, go is going to be uh, a catalyst for us to, to achieve our objective. And we were a little bit different in that we weren't attacking, say, one particular problem, but I think kind of in the evolution of things. So you know, we had migrated to Agile, and similar to when companies go from waterfall to Agile, we saw the DevOps best practices out there. We, you know, we read the Phoenix Project. Uh, we started doing things like that. We started participating in the DevOps community, which is a very great, strong community, very open, very helpful. Saw people that were having a lot of the same struggles and challenges that we were, and some of the different methodologies that they were using to be successful, and wanted to apply some of those things. So it wasn't you know, like you guys with retail or something like that. It was just a better, how do we get better overall as a company and evolve our best practices to develop software? It's funny, I feel like there's a thread emerging. You know, Courtney, you brought up the point of moving from a cost perspective to a speed perspective. Mm -hmm. There's sort of a truism when you're growing a software company around, you can't cost cut your way to success. Right. <laughs> and it feels like large enterprises sort of starting to recognize that, that everyone's a software company in some sense nowadays. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's, it's much more difficult to pivot a you know, large multinational organization than a 20 person startup. Right, and I think a lot of the, you know, the practices are grounded in lean. Mm -hmm. And when you try to talk about that in software, you get a lot of skepticism. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, it applies to manufacturing, it applies to healthcare, I understand that. 
But when you try to apply it to shipping software, you get a lot of people saying it won't apply. Yeah. So it's like, how do you help people see that it does apply? And it's methodology independent, because we had a lot of people who said, oh, it's just the next Agile. No, it applies to everything. So it's been interesting just to observe. I think one of the big differences at DevOps Enterprise Summit, I think Patrick Dubois got up and talked about how in the early days of DevOps, he was very keen to not put too tight a box around it, mm -hmm. which definitely, I think the Agile Manifesto in some ways kind of hurt the Agile movement because it became very specific, quite rigid, and it was like, okay, we're gonna take that and we're gonna go off and consult away and make a lot of money. Whereas DevOps, I think, keeping it relatively fluid and focused on outcomes allowed it to mutate and shift in different directions. Jane looks like he might have a comment there about this. No, no, I was wondering if you reflect on that, that was really a treat. It was, it was, it was pretty special. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's sort of interesting. It definitely came out of a software culture but then it's like, as enterprises all realize that they're all becoming software companies, we started bringing those in. So along the lines of that sort of mindset shift, were there any major processes or other kinds of minds, mindset shifts that were required to start being successful? I don't know if I'd say it was one thing for us or one major shift. I think it was starting to gradually chip away at things. So moving to agile practices, getting our operations teams in the agile practice, I think automation was a key piece of that. And that's from, you know, continuous integration is a, a key part of our culture, and it has been for many, many years, so much so that we don't even really think about something like that. So it's foundational for us. Building out automated tests, I would say, of all the automation that we've done in recent times, that's probably the most important. It's allowed us to move a lot, soft, a lot faster and more quickly with software. And then it also allows us to validate our changes in production. So we put changes in. It used to be all manual validation and now we can automate a lot of that. There's still some manual, but we're moving more towards that direction. So I've had to pick a few key things. I'd say that those are, those are the ones, but again, it's been kind of evolutionary. And I've um, seen a lot of uh, need for evolution in how leaders show up. Mm. So there's a lot around, um, at least in my experience, the traditional IT leader is um, kind of setting direction maybe or managing work versus being really close to the work. And so when you start talking about things like you should know what your team's doing, but you should know so you can help, it's like, oh, well, you're saying I should micromanage my team. And I'm like, I didn't say go and tell. I said go and see. Yeah. Go observe. Ask questions. Be, an, um, be someone who can remove uh, constraints and bottlenecks. But Creating that environment is really hard when you've been conditioned to be, well, I'm the director of the work. Well, not really, not anymore. Well, you never were. Um, <laughs> and you never were, yeah. yeah. So on a reality. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the big mindset shifts we've seen has been that managers have to learn to, you know, in a way, embrace failure. Mm -hmm. if, they, if you're moving from a world where you're shipping really large chunks once a year, once every 18 months, and it was a complete disaster if any release failed internally to one where you're shipping multiple times a day, the managers have to get away from that mindset of, oh my God, a release failed today. Yeah. You know, it should be a smaller chunk, they get to roll back more quickly. Mm -hmm. I, feel, I think also this, it's, it's uh, what I tried to do actually was to get things to be more community driven because the type of people that, or that we're trying to develop now are really full stack, so they're really super clever. And so to maximize uh, the, the, you know, the value that you, you get from these teams is actually to empower them and let them dis make the decisions. And, you know, the internet was very, is very successful. Why is the internet very successful? Why are many open source projects very successful? Because it's community driven. So I see myself really now, as, as we've said here, that you're trying to facilitate your team to, to make the decisions and to, and, and to lead. So the team actually is it's a community driven way of, um, of, of delivering and of or orchestrating and organizing themselves. It, I think this was the, the biggest point. In terms of the processes that we had to, to overcome, we were quite fundamental because we were very, very much an initial-driven organization with lots of different silos and passing you know, certain stage gates when we had to do something. And if we're putting together full-stack teams that go across all these, then you, know, you don't need a service transition department with a 200-page document when you actually, the team, you're, tr you're creating the service and transitioning it into yourself. So it's quite a, um, a difficult um, journey to go on to actually change these processes, make them super lightweight and actually relevant for this, the, the way that you want to work and communicate. 
So there's quite a lot of um, uh, negotiation and education and, um, and, and, and difficult uh, you know, problems to overcome. The ITIL transition can be kind of complicated. I was yeah. talking to someone who's actually in the room right now, and I'm going to avoid looking at them, um, about <laughs> how once they'd started automating everything, their change control board was having trouble keeping up with exactly. all of the changes. Yeah. And when they're in a world where they're like, yeah. you know, I, you, I'm used to reviewing a change every three yeah. or four days yeah. versus yeah. there's 25 exactly. today. But this is not to say that, that it, ITIL is, is a bad thing. I think it, it, as a framework, it's good. It just needs, you know, when you're doing DevOps, it needs to be changed so that it can keep pace. So you say with the change control board, if you've got a, a continuous delivery pipeline, okay, go through that process once, get that pipeline signed off, then everything else that goes through that pipeline is just BAU. So that there are ways to do it, but it takes you know, a negotiation, and also it's, it's a form you have to get the trust. So you have to demonstrate your capability, because you know, we, they, they always come along, oh, DevOps, you're just a bunch of cowboys. And this is, you know, a cultural gain, a cultural thing that you have to overcome. So by demonstrating your capability and actually your quality is going to improve, your velocity increases. And, and actually, you know, one of the big wins here is that the marketing department actually want to use the IT department. That's a, that's a fantastic win rather than, you know, trying to avoid it. I think that's another interesting point that we've often seen many large enterprises. These practices start in the digital group. You know, because they're the ones who the web developers tend to be more plugged in with what's actually possible, and they're like, well, I could spend six months requisitioning hardware and infrastructure, or we could just use the credit card on Amazon and, yeah. like, just start pushing out yeah. some node, yeah. a node apps. <laughs> and so we often see that as a locus of change yeah. within the organization. It's, inter it's interesting, though, because that's where we saw it start, but then there was back to the skepticism. Well, I got accused of picking a unicorn within the horse <laughs> yep. environment. And I was like, oh no, I like stepped in my own trap. Yep. And so it's like, well, how can you show examples that work that aren't just in that digital space, right? Because it might be a way to demonstrate, but then you also have to figure out a way, and you probably have some examples where it's non-digital, right? Where you've been able to demonstrate yeah. similar results, like in mainframe apps or, yeah. We, yeah. For us, it's uh, kind of good to hear a lot of uh, validation because I was in development in the software development side of things before I joined uh, St. Joseph, and I've seen this transition. I think there's a lot of similarities between traditional SDLC to agile methodology, and I think the whole transition is so parallel that I, I can just uh, vision myself applying this same kind of uh, awareness to change uh, the, the, the transition that you know, and I, I think there's a lot of value of learning and looking at Agile and applying it here too, from ITSM to kind of DevOps model uh, and how, how it's not one or the other, is how you leverage best out of your traditional ITSM and also leverage DevOps and get used to it. And some of the examples we heard about addressing teams' needs, concerns are, are paramount, right? If you don't have people who have bought into it, that's going to be very difficult, and that's that's what we have focused. Another thing that we focused on was uh, we kind of afforded opportunity to do this in parallel. So keep your current stream as is. Start creating a new stream where you get to practice and demonstrate the quick wins, as as, as you spoke of, right? Uh, the success criteria. Let's take a couple of apps or a couple of uh, applications and migrate it to this new track and demonstrate, and then kind of use that as a, a self-fulfilling marketing, and then uh, gracefully transition all the service lines over to that. I know there's lots of competing opinions on whether you should have a DevOps team or not, but I thought one interesting thing along the points you were raising was someone I spoke to recently, they formed a DevOps team that everyone knew lasted nine months. Like, that was the time period, and it was cross-functional. They pulled them all together, and at the end of the nine months, everyone spread out throughout the organization. And then six months later, all of those teams were starting to adopt new practices. Well, thank you. Uh, Courtney, I'll never look at a Starbucks uh, uh, Pike Place Fente again, knowing that it's a DevOps process. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you all invest in, your, in, your, in the education of your staff? Hmm. I start with um, value stream mapping which may sound like not the right place to start, but I think if you can get a team rallied around 
how do we get value into our customer's hands? And customer can be defined however you decide. Um, but bringing them together and saying, we're here to solve for the same outcome. And then how can we have a non-emotional discussion? Because to your point, the silos exist. It's a reality. So how do you figure out how to get the teams together and use a technique like that, which is pretty lo-fi? I mean, it's just documenting what are the steps it takes to get value you know, from initiation to production. Um, so I find that with some amount of definition around terms that you're going to use, because that can, get, um, that can get really messy if you don't invest in that up front. But then it's a balance. Because if you go right to like the seven ways, unless you use the software development ones that I think Mary uh, created, which are more relevant, um, people will just start their eyes glaze over. So it's like, how do you right size it so that people see it as um, they get excited about it and also um, understand it enough? So you get enough baseline understanding, but then a practice that isn't just sitting in a classroom and or um, just go read some textbook. Now, the Phoenix Project, I agree. I think that is like a really good way for people to get educated. Um, and at least a base understanding as well. But I found that I, I start with that value stream mapping exercise, and it helps a lot. I would say from our standpoint, we don't really have a, a formal training curriculum or anything like that. But what we did historically is we got some key leaders, and, and we provided some training and, and discussions around DevOps. And then we started having basically proof of concept teams, like you talked about, getting some wins with these teams. Um, getting some team to, to completely set up their environment with configuration as code. And they become then the uh, evangelist to the rest of the organization. And we, in March of this year, went through a major reorganization where we had a separate dev org and a separate ops org. And we merged those together. And so I think we are getting a lot of education simply by doing. Um, the, the developers were well versed for the most part in the, the best practices in the software development community that are brought to us with Agile and continuous integration, starting to get into continuous delivery and just automation in general. And they're bringing those by their very nature to the, the ops teams as they see the challenges that they're solving. And then the ops teams are educating our dev teams. So it's really more of an a, immersion thing, I would say, than a, than a formal training. I think one of the good immersion techniques that I've seen lots of people say is quite successful is starting to involve your developers in on-call. Mm. Um, and if you can't get them to cross that bridge, at least get them involved in your postmortems and retrospectives, because they'll pop up and go, well, that thing, you could have written some code that actually would have stopped that whole part of the process from failing. That was, I mean, that was an important part for us, actually, was to have these full stack teams, so developers were on call. Uh, we were fortunate in that we didn't have any software developers at all when we started the digital transformation. It was all outsourced. What we did have, we had more traditional ops teams that would actually do sort of like second line support and then escalate to vendors. So these guys, there was quite a lot of them, um, they wanted to become DevOps. And what, 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 what I did was actually I rec recruited people with the, the technical skills to deliver the technical aspects of DevOps. And then we did more like extreme programming. So we'd actually pair them up. Uh, so they'd learn on the job the, the tools. And then we did more formal training to get configuration management skills in and, and to, to sit in an agile team to, go, to learn the, you know, um, how a Kanban board works and things like that. And it's mainly on the job training. And, and, and we found that with this, with the evangelization that was happening, that, that people were getting really excited and they're really eager to learn. So it was a good way of upskilling the existing uh, uh, people. But to, it was, the challenge was actually on finding enough people to come in and actually use them as a vehicle to do this. So the, we, you know, they, they were, we were hiring like, hundreds of software developers and creating you know, tens and tens of um, these full stack teams and to find people with the, the skills in configuration management, deliver continuous um, delivery pipelines and all the metrics and monitoring is, is quite difficult. Have you found it has uh, interested, because I think education is just one part of sort of speaking to the fear of change inside large organizations. And I know I've run across, across quite regularly a certain kind of ops person who's like, I've never been a developer. I've never written code, and even though they may have written shell scripts and Perl scripts and all sorts of things, they're like, I'm not a developer, I don't know how to be a developer, you're going to expect me to be a developer, and suddenly my job's going to change. 
I'm sort of curious about well, they just fall into it, I don't. Yeah. So if you start writing infrastructure as code now, say we're using Puppet, then actually, before they know it, they are a software developer, and then you can use software development techniques to do that. And before they know it, they're actually doing it, and it's and and if you, they've got someone that they're doing with in this like per programming way, and they, they just people tend to fall into it without realizing it. And then one day they wake up and it's an aha moment. Well, actually, I'm a software developer. And, and, and it's generally, you're right. <laughs> Touch wood. I think many ops people don't actually realize how many software developers fell into being a software developer themselves. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think you've got to demonstrate some wins, too. I mean, yeah. you definitely have resistance to that because yeah. it's scary. But when they start to actually see, hey, this task that used to take me an hour, now I can click yeah. a button, or this thing that used to be very error prone, now I've got automated mm -hmm. tests around it. It starts to just kind of speak for itself. Mm. I, I think there is a component of uh, addressing uh, fear, right? Uh, is if I automate everything, I'm automating myself out of job. And, and that's where I tend to kind of uh, evangelize a thought process and a mentoring of, well, there are a lot more uh, automation, a lot more knowledge base, a lot more valuable stuff that you can do when you don't do your repetitive stuff. And, and that's another thing, another technique that I've used uh, in past where, uh, you know, truly taking them through mentorship and journey. And, and, and that's very important. When you make them comfortable, then the resistance kind of goes away and, and they're proactively engaged into uh, this new journey. It's funny, some of the things you touched on there feel relevant to, I've been doing a lot of reading around conscious leadership and all of those sort of various things. And I was thinking one of the worst examples I've ever seen was going and talking to a large engineering and operations group. And the director's intro to me was like, this is Nigel. He's from Puppet. He's here. Then we're going to automate everything. And then I get to fire you all. Ha, 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 and walked off stage. <laughs> oh. And I was like, <laughs> no, I'm not sure how well this is going to actually work. <laughs> and he was totally joking. But I, uh, there, was, there was real uh, fear uh, in yeah. the room. Yeah. Um, do we have any questions around that? That feels like something reasonably practical. I would have expected a few sort of questions around. What are, where do people see the fear in their organizations? One fear that I see working in a bank, we're very traditional, very controlled. And it seems like one of the criteria to be successful in a DevOps environment is to empower your users. And the balance there from my standpoint is, as soon as I start empowering them to do work, all of a sudden they have this backdoor root level control to my systems that they can plant all sorts of things. How do you handle that kind of that migration of control without losing control? That's trust though, you, you just said. You don't trust them. So why are they gonna plant backdoor access into your system? So let me rephrase. It's not me that doesn't trust them, yeah. it's the auditor that's gonna to come to me to ask to prove who, don't, who doesn't trust them. So the, the infrastructure teams are on the hook with auditors, assessors, risk controls, and they all come at you at different angles. And you all have to approve why your system's safe. Yeah, but the new tools that actually give better auditing capability. So again, I think it's a case of demonstrating that if you use the new technologies and new tools and new ways of working, actually, you, you know, you're ticking more boxes and, and the, 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 you should be able to demonstrate that they should trust you more. But it sounds like that's a trust issue. Well, well there's trust, but how do you verify that, right? I mean, you, you think, from a Linux standpoint, sudo, root level controls. How do I know that something that's being done through the configuration management that's outside of my control isn't planting a rootkit? I mean, they see the majority of all compromises come from inside anyway. Mm. So how do I show that I, my systems, while I trust my application and developers, that they're still safe? Well, I think we're going through an evolution of this at the moment right. amongst the infrastructure as code right. tools. And the ones that are doing well are all the ones that give reporting and yeah. give auditing capabilities. Yeah. Well, and this is an example where, and you mentioned this earlier, that this community is about sharing. So what I find is if I'm encountering a problem like you're describing, someone else is. And in your particular industry, talk to Capital One. Yeah. They are doing this at scale. And they have figured out how to get through some of those challenges. And you know, I look at Gene, because he probably knows better than I do, but it's like, there, it is a common, um, uh, I guess, a barrier to adoption. And that's in retail, too. It's like, oh, prove to me through SOX or PCI or whatever the compliance mm. um, board is that this is actually safer. And what's kind of crazy is it is. 
I think it's like how I'd, do you I'd point you definitely that? at Nate Loomis's talk on from Wells Fargo at, at the end of the day tomorrow. Oh. He's going to be talking about sharing inside that sort of an environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. but I think as John Willis pointed out on the keynotes this morning, for those of you who were there, if we're getting banks to the point where they're going to run Chaos Monkey against financial yeah. transactions, mm -hmm. like, That's great. but ultimately risk is lower because they're, it's, it's, they're managed testing. Sorry. Um, the notion that DevOps solves a lot of our traditional IT problems. What problems has it created for you? Resourcing. Yeah, I was going to say hiring is the yeah. one you hear all the time. <laughs> yeah. And training, as you brought up yeah. earlier. You know. And I would say, um, how do I want to say this? Uh, the labeling of the activities, but then you, it's really not that. So you get this um, perception that DevOps is happening, but then you inspect and it's like, oh, that's actually not. So I had an example of, you know, oh, we have a DevOps team. And I'm like, fantastic. Mm -hmm. I go and I talk to these folks and it's like, oh yeah, we're the, we're the rapid release team. We take all of the production support defects and we quickly resolve them and then they go into QA and then we wait six weeks and then we deploy them. And I was like, <laughs> Oh, that's nice. <laughs> so I think I think what I've encountered is everyone's excited about it, which you don't want to squash because the energy is great. But then how do you make sure that it's about solving the right problem and that you don't get like for us, agile was let's just go do it. We're not going to do waterfall anymore. And really, we just were doing waterfall. But we were just using all the terms. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Scrumafall is one of the worst. Yeah. <laughs> And I think uh, there is a truth to this uh, is uh, talking about and, and pigeonholing uh, roles and responsibilities because DevOps, just by saying that, you know, people have different definitions as you just started off there. What does it mean to you? You already heard four different uh, definitions, a little bit similar, mm -hmm. but there are still nuance to it. And that's where one of these roles and uh, uh, kind of uh, keeping it a little bit fluffy on the outside, or I would say gray on the border and edges, will take your DevOps program forward, rather than, hey, that's not me. That's, again, going to traditional silos mentality. Hey, that's not my job. That's somebody else's job. Let's be a little bit loose over that, and, and that kind of takes your journey much more sm smoother than your traditional, hey, these are the five roles in DevOps. This person does this, 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 and this. And you're bringing all the old problems back. One of the great sources of anti-patterns I see is one of the few areas of Reddit that I read is the DevOps subreddit, which is full of people who actually don't have really have very much experience in the space. And so you'll see questions like, you know, well, I decided to do DevOps, so I'm using Docker and Node.js. And you're like, <laughs> this doesn't actually match at all. Or you'll get someone going, I just got a DevOps job, and it's clear there's this huge waterfall, and they're just at the end of it. <laughs> Um, what advice can you give for IT teams that have conflicting or different ideas of DevOps? Um, I work for university research where in, uh, we're more innovative, so we use Puppet to deploy and configure and install. And then we're going to uh, merge IT teams with the hospital, which is also one of part of the university. Um, theirs is a more stable, more government compliant because they're um, usual reason is um, if the patient, let's say, ventilator goes, uh, turns off because of, let's say, a public deploy code, then someone would die. So it's more of uh, life saving versus or stability versus innovation. And then we're going to merge in a few months. So that's the challenge for us right now. What advice could you give for conflicting IT teams? Um, DevOps concept of that? I would say I wouldn't expect everyone's definition of DevOps to be exactly the same, and it probably shouldn't be. Just like agile teams, each team runs a little bit different, and they're a self-enabled team, and they're looking at the constraints that they're operating under, the personnel that are on that team, the problems that they're solving. Uh, I think each team should somewhat define that themselves, but I think we need to have kind of a common framework at a higher level, and different metrics that they should be marching to that are kind of agreed throughout the organization and then kind of the 
the nitty gritty details of how you get there is then up to the individual teams. I think you touched an interesting point with metrics there, and I was going to go through and ask everyone, how are you measuring the success of these programs? Like if measurement is one of the core tenets of DevOps, how do we measure at a large enterprise level whether it's working? There's many ways, aren't there? I mean, you know, you can go down to something as simple as you know, your release velocity, but I think a really a, 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 a important one is actually, are you selling more stuff at the end of the day? So it's bottom line. And then an interesting one is, you know, is, is the, the marketing department actually using the IT department now? Mm. Or are they still going out with their credit card? Because that means, you know, if, if the marketing department will come to you to deliver the services, it's a success. Normally, in a large enterprise, they do everything they can to avoid going through IT. So, so there's lots of ways to measure it. And I, and I think, actually, it's, it's having these measures and communicate them so that everyone knows about them and, vis and have them visual so that everyone can see. So that way, you, you measure your progress as well. So in DevOps, it's all about communication and about having transparency, openness, and actually uh, and having all these agreed measures so that you know, you've got nothing to hide. I think there are two different levels of measurements. Uh, one is internal. Obviously, that motivates your internal team. Hey, we did this many uh, stories and uh, this many deployments and uh, kind of KPIs that you can do that. A second to what you, uh, you're saying is just tying why you're doing DevOps. And majority of the times, you have a business reason. That's how you sell. We talked about selling it to your internal teams. We didn't speak about, you know, how do you sell that to your organization? You want X number of things. We are doing something different. It's going to make life better, and there's going to be a business impact to it. So, like you mentioned, you know, selling it faster, or marketing is using us more, or partner of choice, or whatever that is, right? Uh, deployments or project timelines getting smaller, and impact to business is another measure that uh, I think would. But I, I think not to miss that with actual things that drive internal teams as well. Mm -hmm. So there are two sets of metrics that I see, at least not, I'm not trying to say hard and fast, but there's flavor of both. It can be difficult to um, incentivize teams who might feel sort of further down the hierarchy yes. by going, look, we made more money. Yeah. And they're like, eh. I, <laughs> I mean, I got paid. On something earlier that, um, that I've used kind of as a proxy for that, which is how much of your work is in breakthrough versus operational. Because if your percentage to breakthrough is going up, then you can typically tie that to you're delivering more value. But then it resonates with the team. Because yeah. then they see, kind of to your point, well, I'm not really automating my way out of a job. I'm getting freed up to do more breakthrough work, or value add, or whatever, however you want to classify it. But it's a way then, and it also ties to um, employee engagement, or if you're tracking NPS from an employee perspective, you'll definitely see that go up as well. Another important one for us was um, ability to safely make change. That's something with our customers working on quality and not impacting them so much. So we've reduced our batch size with our releases and drastically reduced the impact to our customers for our releases. But now we're looking at individual changes and putting those into production and how we're doing on those and tracking on incidents. Um, and Gene Kim actually had a, a comment in a DevOps Enterprise Summit crowd chat. Um, it's a very fuzzy metric, but one that hit home for me, and that's the extent to which you fear change and fear deployments um, is a good measure of how your DevOps initiatives are working. Um, so I really like that one. Uh, I've got some, some products that I've gained with that have some tech debt and high risk of change. And I think buying that down goes a long way towards, towards showing your DevOps success. I think we saw that in the state of DevOps report that the deployment pain is a really great proxy for whether you're a high performing IT organization. And it's so simple to measure. You just like send out a you know, Google survey that's like zero to 10, how painful was this deployment? Yes. People take two seconds to do it and you see which way it's trending. Yes, and I have to continue to drumbeat the if you don't feel the pain, you won't fix it. Yeah. Because we get a lot of like, oh my gosh, we've gone faster. It's bumpy. Well, let's go slower. Yeah. Or let's put in freezes. It's like, no, we're actually that is going to either make us not address the problem, or we're going to actually have more problems because then we're going to have even a bigger batch. That's an interesting one. And I think probably worth addressing. I often I see resistance internally to going. No, we have maintenance windows. We have change windows. Mm -hmm. How do you start undoing those within the organization? Some of it is you have to show through results. 
Yep. Yeah. Like I can actually deploy this thing and not cause a problem. Yeah. Yep. And you can deploy it at any time. Yeah. So you don't have to wait for the weekend or at two o'clock in the morning. So you, you know you, the aim is to demonstrate that you can deploy whatever as a matter of course at any time you want. Someone stuck their hand up around this? Yeah. So my question was going back to staffing a little bit. Um, and with it being, it's difficult to build out a DevOps organization and hire. So you have to nurture, you have to be a bit more creative and look for things. What background skills characteristics have you found to be the most successful as you build out your DevOps practices? I have a really strong opinion here. I, yeah. I think we should be behaviorally hiring far more often than we do in terms of yeah. bullet lists of experience. And you're looking for people who exhibit a pattern of learning. Yeah. Yes. And like, they're adaptable. They want people that like change. It's quite, quite a good thing. And they like to, to, like to learn. So that, you know, you, someone who will see something and say, oh, I want to find out more about that. And without any prompting, they'll go off and research and learn it. I think you know, those are the sort of people that, that you really want. I think it goes hand in hand with learning is mm. having initiative and drive to push through mm. to do that learning, to find new ways of doing things and constantly to be improving. Maybe you don't have the skill set today, but I'm going to give you a problem. If you don't know how to solve it, you're going to go figure it out and you're going to learn something mm. and be better for it. And next time, um, it'll be just something that becomes routine. And I think um, the curiosity piece, um, also persistence, and then discipline which often I don't think is talked about, but is critical because there has to be a minim, like a minimal set of guardrails to actually make this successful. And I think somebody said like, there's the assumption that you, know, you go to this um, approach and it's chaos. It's actually not. Mm -hmm. It's actually structured, but the right amount of structure. So finding people who thrive in that because whether it's right or wrong, and I used to live in an infrastructure engineering role and ops, heroics are rewarded. Mm -hmm. So how do you break that cycle in your organization and say, we're actually not gonna reward heroics. We're gonna reward that you, you, know, you solved the problem, but you solved it in a different way. Mm -hmm. And that can be challenging, I think. Someone mentioned to me the other day, they now give bonuses to their employees if they take all their leave. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Which I was like, what a great metric. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah, that's great. Like, that's just absolutely awesome. Yeah, I also think the one important thing is you need diversity as well. Mm -hmm. So really, you really want to, to get a real diverse team. I think that's quite important. I think if you're hiring senior people in, someone tactically a year or so ago gave me a really good bit of advice when I was talking about a candidate. And they were like, I said, like, well, they've adopted this technology and this one and this one. And they're all great things. And they were like, but what you, when did they adopt them? And there is a really big difference between someone adopting an automation infrastructure as code approach mm -hmm. this year versus six years ago. Mm -hmm. And sort of looking to see if you're looking to hire those senior leaders who are going to be sort of change agents within the org, when did they adopt things in terms of the adoption cycle? And the people who adopted things earlier are often more plausible change agents. So we've got a few minutes left. So I think we've got at least one more question. Yeah. How did you get your... Uh So um, that is a great question. Right. Um, part of it is, this is where you know, I'm going to say again, I, I think that that starts as a leadership uh, problem. It's do you have people in um, your key leadership roles who can articulate the reason why it's a value and then actually create the space for the team to actually do the work and then show the results. Because I think often it's like, well, we're going to do automated testing, but we're going to do it um, secret. We're going to do it in secret because the business, A, doesn't care about it, or they're not going to let us do it. No, be transparent about it, but show what value is going to come out of it, and then protect that capacity. And that's where I think sometimes leaders will fall down because they'll say, in the moment, well, I'm getting pressure, and something's got to get thrown over the side. So we're going to throw off the automated testing. And then you're just kicking the can. So it's like, how do you create that environment where that space is really protected? One thing I've seen work is um, if you've already got an existing process for incident response or you know, remediating a major outage, is getting everyone to agree that one of the steps there is writing a test 
to solve that specific problem. And then you just start building up trust within the organization. So I would, get, I would venture that Starbucks is the, has the most consumer demand. I don't know what CSG does, I don't, I'm sorry. How do you keep up with what the, what the consumer is wanting next? Like, we're paying with our phones. I can call and get it ready when I show up, those types of things. How do you stay ahead of that? Um, so I should probably divulge that I've been at Starbucks for four months. <laughs> <laughs> and prior to that, I was at Nordstrom. So, I mean, I, you could maybe ask the same, same question. But um, uh, I think it's... Um, you know, obviously, there's the traditional mechanisms where you're, you know, you're getting voice of customer and you're staying ahead of kind of what do you think the next capability is. But for me, at least in the role that I'm in, it's how do I, as um, a technology leader, how do I make sure that we're not the constraint? So always optimizing for the constraint. Like, how am I not in the way when they go to want to do the next thing? Oh, sorry, you know, we have this antiquated architecture and that's going to take six months. So focusing on that, like how do we, um, how do we get faster? Uh, yeah. And in the retail uh, side, we have what we call concept stores. So we would put out, and we have whole departments whose job it is to come up with the wackiest way to buy groceries and things like that. And, and generally we use concept mm -hmm. stores to, as uh, innovation centers. But then... You know, um, you do need the, the underlying infrastructure and capability to deliver these things quickly to fail fast and move on. So, you know, as Courtney says, you've got to ensure that you're not um, impinging this because then these sort of um, marketing departments and other innovation centers will actually bypass the IT department to go and actually do, do these things. Mm -hmm. So now I've got my mind racing of what the wackiest ways in the world to buy groceries can actually do. <laughs> but I think with that, we've had hit just about the time limit. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone on the panel. Thanks.